Hello, I'm Alex, and today we're trying something a little bit different on the channel. A regular roundup of the biggest stories in self-hosting, home servers, open source tech, and everything in between. I'll dig into some news and give you some context for it as well, and hopefully keep things fun and entertaining along the way. There are chapter markers down below for those of you that want to skip beyond a particular story or topic. So grab a coffee or a libation of your choosing, and let's dive into this week's self-hosted headlines. I'm gonna start with ZFS AnyRaid. This is a significant development for the data storage community, with HexOS, a NAS operating system built on top of TrueNAS, announcing an innovative new feature. They've called this ZFS AnyRaid. This initiative is sponsored by Eshtech, the company behind HexOS, and it aims to revolutionize how ZFS handles storage pools, particularly addressing the long-standing limitation concerning mixed-sized drives. Note that this announcement is merely a ZFS devs have agreed to work on this feature, and we are going to fund some development time, not that the feature is fully baked and ready to ship. I would imagine this is still a very long way off actually shipping. But why is this worth following and potentially a huge deal for ZFS users? Well, traditionally, ZFS has been lauded for its robustness and data integrity features, of course. However, it's maintained a rigid approach to storage configurations in order to facilitate that. Specifically, when creating a RAID Z pool with drives of varying sizes, ZFS would default to the capacity of the smallest drive across all of those drives, leading to underutilization on some of those drives, and this constraint has been a pain point for users looking to expand storage without replacing existing drives for many, many years. In fact, it's probably why Unraid even exists in the first place. This development is a particularly significant development for the ZFS community and home users in general, and maybe even small businesses too, who often deal with cheaper consumer grade hardware, often with higgledy piggledy storage hardware, you know, I've got a 10 terabyte drive over here and a six over here. And like, we don't want to buy 20 disks all at once or even an entire Z pool or, or VDEVs worth of disks all at once. The idea behind any raid is that it reduces the need for uniform drive uh, requirements really, and offers a more cost-effective and flexible storage solution for those of us in the real world, not buying data centers worth of disks at a time. Now, whilst the feature is still under development with no definitive release date, its announcement has generated considerable excitement within the tech community, myself included, actually. For me, it's a testament to the ever-evolving nature of open source projects and their responsiveness to user needs. But do not hang your hat on this. Do not buy HexOS thinking that this is a fully-fledged feature. RAID Z expansion took nearly a decade to be released, and whilst I'm optimistic that this won't take as long as that, the ZFS project is not one to be rushed. In other news, Mozilla, the company behind Firefox, has decided to shutter Pocket, a popular Read It Later service, like uh, Instapaper and a couple of others in this space. Mozilla's announcement on May the 22nd, 2025, that Pocket would cease to exist come July the 8th, 2025, represents more than just a discontinuation of a single product. It signals for me a fundamental strategic realignment for the organization as it grapples with evolving market dynamics and financial pressures, as well as the need to maintain its independence in an increasingly competitive digital landscape. Mozilla's public explanation for shuttering Pocket centers on strategic resource allocation and evolving user behavior patterns. According to the company's official blog post, the way people save and consume content on the web has evolved. So we're channeling our resources into projects that better match browsing habits for the modern web. This reasoning reflects Mozilla's assessment that Pocket's traditional read it later functionality no longer aligns with contemporary digital consumption patterns where users increasingly rely on social media feeds, algorithmic recommendations, and instant access materials rather than the deliberate curation of reading materials. Yes, and I'm aware of the irony that I'm delivering this news to you on an algorithmic platform, but um, perhaps they have a point. The closure of Pocket must be understood within the context of Mozilla's precarious financial situation and overwhelming dependence on a single revenue source. Mozilla CFO Eric Mulheim testified in court that approximately 90% of Mozilla's revenue comes from Firefox, with about 85% of that revenue stemming from the organization's default search deal with Google. 
Now you know me, I do like me some self-hosting, and for users seeking to replace Pocket's functionality whilst maintaining control over their data, several self-hosted alternatives offer comparable features with the added benefit of complete user ownership and customization. No intuitification or service closures here. Wallabag represents probably one of the most mature and feature complete self-hosted alternatives to Pocket. This open source application available under the MIT license provides comprehensive article saving, classification, and offline reading capabilities. Wallabag supports multiple languages and can be customized extensively due to its open source nature. This makes it suitable for users with varying technical requirements and preferences. Next up is Shiori, which offers a lightweight Go-based alternative that emphasizes simplicity and efficiency. This is designed as a simple clone of Pocket. Shiori provides essential bookmarking functionality with features including basic bookmark management, important export capabilities, and offline archiving as well. Shiori supports automatic creation of offline archives and readable content parsing, ensuring that saved articles remain accessible even if the original source becomes unavailable. And finally, in our top three picks for this is LinkAce. LinkAce provides a more comprehensive bookmarking archiving solution with advanced monitoring and backup capabilities. The platform automatically monitors saved links for availability and provides notifications when websites move or become available. The platform's sophisticated tagging and list management features make it particularly suitable for users who maintain large, well-organized bookmark collections and require robust search and filtering capabilities. Now, the next one on my list, and this really is the final one, is Karakeep. This isn't really your typical read it later type app, but it is also worth a look. It will archive links, it will create tags using AI, and it also has many other interesting features. It's the app formerly known as Hoarder, and it really has some potential in this space, but as of right now, it's not really a true read it later contender. To be honest, when I spanned these three up and had a quick look at them whilst researching this video, I found Wallabag to be about the best of the bunch here, and hopefully the extra attention it's getting since the Pocket announcement will fuel a slew of new features for it. For example, they are working hard right now on a CSV import feature from Pocket, as well as a hosted version for those of you that don't want to self-host Wallabag, but also have your bookmarks and, and uh, read it later service, not be beholden to big tech. Now in other news, I was literally just about to hit render on this video and Plex have dropped, I don't wanna say a bombshell because at this point I am absolutely not surprised, but Plex have come along and said that for Plex accounts created before March 20th, 2025, we require your consent to sell your personal data as described in our privacy policy. Agree, do not agree. We want to sell your personal data and clicking through this further, um, it goes on to say that I consent to Plex to sell certain personal information with hashed emails and advertising identifiers to third parties for advertising and marketing purposes. Now, if you've been following Plex for any length of time, this will be exactly 0% surprising to you, along with the fact that water is wet, probably. But I can't believe they actually sent out this message and uh, I've created a Reddit thread about it, so we'll have a little moan over there about this, no doubt, about the state of Plex and, and all that, but um, maybe it really finally is actually time that you switch to Jellyfin. I know it sounds like a cliche at this point to say that, but uh, Plex just keep putting their foot in it, don't they? Pocket ID is a really great little app and one of my favorite discoveries of the first half of 2025. Pocket ID lets you log into any service that supports OIDC with minimal configuration and no passwords, pass keys only. Now, if you wanna find out more about Pocket ID, I did a video about this in my day job over at the Tailscale YouTube channel, if you'd like to see more of it in action. If you're familiar with locally hosted S3 compatible storage, then you've almost certainly at some point come across MinIO. Unfortunately, MinIO seemed determined to eat their own face. A few years ago, there was a huge migration schema change on the back end, which left a lot of users, myself included, high and dry between different versions of the Docker containers. But unfortunately, MinIO have decided to continue that trajectory of making them an untenable project by removing a huge amount of code from their community edition. 
In what can only be described as a hostile move from the project, they've removed some 114,000 lines of code in a single PR, link down below, PR 3509. Almost all admin features and many other UI-based features have been removed and put behind a paywall. Mileo are clearly taking a leaf out of the Broadcom playbook with this one, I suspect. Taking features that were free and putting them behind a paywall is always going to garner significant criticism, especially for a project that has been community-led for so much of its life. Oh, and by the way, the pay tier, which starts at a mere $96,000 per year, Yep, that's a flat fee for any amount of storage up to 400 terabytes. It's $96,000 a year. Now, I understand developers have got to eat, but that doesn't sit right with me. The community maintain a fork called OpenMax.io. Not clear whether this is a fork in direct response to this move by Mineo, but it's great to see the community stepping up when companies end shitify like this. A highly regarded alternative in the self-hosted space is Garage. I'll put a link in the description for you to check out this project. But if you're looking for a lightweight way to host S3 stuff, either on-premise or just not pay hyperscaler API prices, Garage is worth your time. John Seeger recently took over as VP of Engineering at Ubuntu as fresh blood atop the engineering tree and has wasted no time in oxidizing Ubuntu. In other words, lots of the project's core utilities and tooling are now being moved to a more modern and Rust-based implementation. As of Ubuntu 25.10, which comes out in October, John announced on his blog this week that sudo will be, by default, using sudo rs. Ubuntu will be the first major Linux distribution to adopt sudo rs as the default. Home Assistant have announced this month they're deprecating two major installation methods, Core and Supervise D. They're also ending support for 32-bit CPU architectures. So those are i386, ARM HF, and ARM v7 architectures. These changes will take effect in December 2025 with version 25.12. So then why this change? Well, the Core and Supervise D installs are complex to maintain. This is the project's words, not mine. They only account for two and a half to three and a half percent of the entire user pie respectively and the 32-bit platforms each have less than 1% of usage as well. So it kind of makes sense to reduce your overhead of maintenance burden by focusing on the platforms where most people are. The project provides a number of migration tips in the linked blog post down below, but the good news is that full backups will now work across all different install types, so you can back up your current system and restore it onto a new one, even across architectures. Computex just wrapped up in Taipei last week and mini PC and DIY NAS vendors, Mini's forum, showed the N5 Pro NAS. I am really excited about this one. This is a compact PC NAS based on the AMD Ryzen AI 9HX Pro 370 SoC with 96 gigabytes of ECC DDR5 memory, a 10 gigabit and a 5 gigabit ethernet port, uh, USB 4 ports, HDMI 2.1, plus support for five, three and a half, or two and a half inch drives as well. It even has a PCIe 16x slot with four lanes of bandwidth for a GPU. Now, out of the box at least, the N5 Pro is going to be running Mini's Forum's Cloud OS or Windows 11. Or maybe Unraid, because in the Unraid ecosystem, LinkStation announced new devices as well at Computex last week. The LinkStation S1, which is a four bay desktop NAS with an Intel N97 CPU, eight gigs of RAM, dual two and a half gig ethernet, and the N2 with two bays and the Intel N100, 16 gigs of RAM and 10 gigabit ethernet. Interestingly, both of these will ship with Unraid pre-installed and pre-licensed. That's pretty cool. And for me, it shows that the DIY NAS space has never been more full of potential. We'll keep abreast of the developments of these products as they ship and hopefully get a few of them in for testing. I highly recommend you also check out Robbie over at NAS Compares. He's got some fantastic videos. He's been visiting the factories in China as well as Computex for a lot of these companies as well. So uh, I'll put a link to Robbie's channel in the description down below. Over on r slash home lab, I found a really cool project called the Think NAS. Those of you who have a 3D printer and have been looking for a way to shrink down your home server, 
might be interested in the Reddit post linked down below. They have combined a Lenovo Think Center with a four times three and a half inch bay hot swap cage for one tidy little four bay NAS. It takes kind of a blade concept for the compute portion. I'll put a link in the description to the Reddit thread down below where creative users are talking about lots more interesting ways to attach multiple drives to these very versatile Lenovo small form factor boxes. I love to see this. Now, this one bit me personally, and this is a public safety announcement for Ghost users. Ghost CMS users encountered a login issue after upgrading their Docker image from 5.118 this week. Anyway, the problem turned out to be that Ghost have introduced stricter authentication requirements for staff users, but fail to log anything to the logs of the container when login fails. A quick fix for this for now is to supply this environment variable up on screen right now to disable staff device verification. As of recording, the Ghost development team haven't officially acknowledged that the issue exists and it remains open on GitHub. And of course, if you're here from the self-hosted podcast, episode 150, the final one just aired this week. So yeah, big thank you to everybody that's been involved in that production over the years. And I'm gonna to link to a blog post that I've written about that whole chapter of my life uh, in the description down below. So as ever, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I've been Alex from KTZ Systems.